that this is going to be the experience of death. And I was very excited. And I discovered one thing. My mind was so weak, there was no fear. Fear, scary fear, scary fear only exists in the mind. It does not exist where our consciousness is. And consciousness is just a word, I use it, but I really prefer to use being. And our being is in the center of our chest, in our heart area. That's where our being is or our consciousness is. So the mind weakened, fear was gone, and I just lay down enjoying every breath. I'm here today with Doug Flomer. Welcome, Doug. Thank you so much for joining me. Nice to be here, Tia. I'm really appreciative that I have this time to spend with you. Uh, you have a quite an interesting experience that happened to you uh, a while back. You were saying in India and something happened. Do you mind telling us about that? Okay, in, in 1979, I was on a spiritual journey to find out what life was about. And I ended up in India. And um, that led to my experience of me physically dying. It was, my, it was something completely unexpected, but it was one of the most beautiful things that has happened to me in my life. Would you like me to explain that process? I would love to hear about it. Yes, please. Okay. So I had amoebiasis, which is amoebic dysentery. I had dengue fever, which is, they some people call it bone break disease because it's really painful. And then I had foodborne hepatitis A because of the hygienic nature of the India in 1979. I was 24 years old and I became very ill. And it was interesting because I weakened very slowly. I thought I, because I was so young and healthy that I would pass by, this would just go by and it wouldn't be anything. But slowly, slowly, I became so weak that my mind, the strength of my mind started diminishing and it wasn't so domineering. And I became aware of something inside of me that was much more present and much more powerful than anything I've ever encountered before. So as I, my body weakened and my mind became less dominant, I noticed that my breathing was like unbelievably expansive. I would take a breath in and I could feel well beyond my body. So then I went back to the hotel room. I shared a flat with uh, a nurse and she was out doing something and I was uh, laying there and I just laid there and I knew I was gonna die. I was not afraid. In fact, I was welcoming it because with a weakened mind and the breath, every breath I took was so relieving. It was so much and I was anticipating that this is gonna be the experience of death. And I was very excited. And I discovered one thing. My mind was so weak, there was no fear. Fear, scary fear, scary fear only exists in the mind. It does not exist where our consciousness is. And consciousness is just a word I use it, but I really prefer to use being and our being is in the center of our chest in our heart area. That's where our being is or our consciousness is. So the mind weakened, fear was gone. And I just lay down enjoying every breath. Keep this in mind. I was dehydrated from the amoebic dysentery. I was in pretty severe pain from the dengue fever and the hepatitis A was not helping matters, right? So I just degraded and I, then I lay in bed. Now this happened over a period of about three days. So I was laying in bed and I was just breathing and all of a sudden this shaking started, this pulse of shaking. God, it was so beautiful. It was just this shaking like this, boom, boom. My body was perfectly still, but this shaking, boom, this rocking, and in it, I just started releasing. That was my body. That was my being releasing from the attachment of this body. And then I discovered during this process of detachment that, yes, this body was heavily traumatized into the indoctrination of my family and into the indoctrination of society. Because in society, where I went, I was baptized a Catholic and I went to Catholic school as a young child. 
and we're, we're just taught fear. And we're taught to believe in stuff and that even as a kid, you know, that's not true. Now, I was a kid back in New York in the, you know, I was born in 1954. And they said, when you die, you go sit on a cloud and you play a harp. As a kid, I'm going, this is not right. This is just, this is not true. And then we are indoctrinated to believe in things that aren't true, like, you know, Santa Claus, the tooth fairy, and on and on. So from a very early age, I knew that I was being lied to, but it's okay. It's okay. That's how we were indoctrinated. And that shaking, as I was shaking out that pulsing, was releasing me from all this structured fear-based belief system. And so, you know, every time I would breathe, back to the breathing again, I noticed there would be a release, something I let go of. And then what happened was the, the mind just turned off. It just turned off. It was no longer active. But what happened was my being was present. And I realized this, my being was always there. It was just overshadowed by the, the non the non-stopping mind or the monkey mind or there's all sorts of names for it. You can give it any name you want, believe me, and they don't have to be flattering. And so I proceeded and I just started shaking out and shaking out. And all of a sudden I stood up by floating and I was looking down at my sick form, my sick body. And I actually started to laugh. So in spirit, that's what I call the thing that left my body, my being, I'll call it spirit also, I realized that there's humor in spirit because I looked at this body and it was so sick. And I had no feelings of attachment any law. But what happened after that was I became so aware of everything. I was, I, I experienced what I call the all in the everything. Some people call it heaven. Some people call it uh, nirvana, and there's other names for it. Yeah, I don't use any of the old names because I like to be more descriptive. So it was it had the vastness of beyond all the galaxies, and it had the depth at the same time. So I experienced that, and I knew that that this was the truth. And I knew I wasn't hallucinating because my mind stopped. And I realized that when I detached from the body, my link to the body was severed. Now, there's a couple of things that happen at this point. During that detachment, something, this energy came to me, and it was fear. However, it was not scary. In fact, it was desirable. And the fear was something that was so compelling. It was, it was so like... You can, it was isolation in there. There was, and all the things we have in this life, fear of everything, isolation, you're alone, you're suffering, all that, that was not scary fear. That you, I actually wanted to experience it again. And that's what I think is reincarnation. And in fact, I know that's what reincarnation is, is you get, if, if you identify with it, you'll come back to a body. Now, when I started looking at it and, and I was being drawn to it, I heard this voice in my head. And the voice was from this, this uh, head of this ashram, Osho, that I was visiting. And it said, if you can observe fear, how can it be part of you? Right there, the connection was broken. Now, this is a story like so many stories you've heard and other people have heard about NDEs. Nothing was near about my death experience. I was dead. And my, because I know after my brain stopped, my heart stopped. And I was fully aware my heart stopped. And so I go, this is something that's so immense. I'm done here. I could see the room I was in, but I wasn't seeing it with eyes. I was seeing it with what we'll call either awareness or consciousness, because I could see the room where I was. I was in a hotel, I was in a flat, but I could see beyond it, but not necessarily in front of me. I could see beyond it all around me, a 360 degree view, like uh, I was a satellite, I don't know. But it was, 
something that was so familiar. I mean, all this information was coming. You would think it would be so overwhelming and how can you manage it? It was so familiar because I've done it before. We've all done it before. So, you know, if you doubt reincarnation is a real thing, okay, you can doubt it, but there's ample evidence out there that with, with the internet, with the development of that, um, there's ample evidence to say, yeah, reincarnation is probably a pretty real thing. And there's other cultures beside ours that absolutely believe in it. And they have evidence of it because someone is, and you've heard these stories, we've all heard them. Some little kid is born, he has recollection, he was in World War II, and he could identify the live members of the ship he was on as a child. And when they were old, he went and identified them because the dad was a minister, a Christian minister brought him there. And this was something that was, uh, I can't, uh, I'm not telling this, I'm just paraphrasing, but it was, um, it was, uh, there was evidence that no one could deny and that old people recognized them. And so reincarnation is enough evidence. You can search it out. So but here's the thing that I don't want anyone to believe my story or disbelieve it, because if you believe a story or you disbelieve it, you satisfy the mind and you will not inquire as to what is the source of the story is, can I experience this? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. You do not have to die to have this experience. The things that are required are you to still your mind, which doesn't happen overnight, but it can. And it's a matter of you just still the mind. And there's so many techniques on this. This has been taught throughout thousands of years, how to still the mind. And Buddha taught it. And other teachers taught it. There's some teachers that are alive now. And if you want to find out, um, you know, if a teacher that you're interested in, listen to like, you know, there's Eckhart Tolle, who's a Westerner. And there's um, Muji, who teaches the Eastern approach. I've met both of these people in spirit, so I know they're the real deal. But there's other people who are parading that they're teachers, and they're not. They're not. I mean, I'm sorry. They're just not. And But there are some really good ones out there. So you can see, search how to still the mind. A lot of times we get, oh, I have to clear something here on the screen. A lot of times we get um, to the point where we're having a mystical experience and we recoil in fear because you can have an out-of-body experience and the Monroe Institute really gives instructions on that. And the thing is, all this stuff is for free. It's all on the internet. You don't need a teacher. You don't need to spend big bucks, unless you want to go traveling somewhere, and that's fine too. Do any, whatever works for you, right? So you can do whatever you like, but the things you have to overcome, if you, if you find yourself out of your body and you're recoiling fear, no big deal. You just succeeded in, in identifying you're not your physical body. Excellent experiment. Excellent. However, if you want to make a habit out of it or get make this part of your life routine, you have to transcend your fear. And that can be done. Uh, I used a breathing technique. It took me a year and a half. I used a breathing technique because I had to come back to the body and I was reconnected back to this body. The same way I was connected to it at the birth process, which I do remember. And once you are reconnected, you take on all the traumas that you had when you left. They all come back. So you can release those. You find out where the story, for me, it was stored on the vagus nerve. That's one of the 12 cranial nerves that runs down each side of the body into the gut. And this breathing technique, and the, the best example of this breathing te technique is a guy named Wim Hof. And he's pretty exaggerated, and he approaches it like a male warrior but you can modify it to your own personal behavior. Okay, that's how I died. And I can tell you in detail, if you wish, what I found after I died. But from my um, way of looking at life is I've given you enough information here so that you can know what to face if you want to experience it yourself. And yes, will that shaking start before you leave your body? It's a shake and just, it's a soothing shake. Yeah, it will, it will. Do you have to have a still mind to do it? Yeah, you do. And stilling the mind is not complicated. None of this stuff is complicated. 
So in order for us to induce this experience for ourselves, we would still our mind and practice the Wim Hof breathing method that is suitable for us. That's if you want to carry this on and keep coming back to this um, experience, you can have an experience by training the mind. Because you know, like you watch uh, the news, they repeat stuff over and over again. They just repeat it. Till you, so you're, they're programming your mind. Well, you can use that same technique. And every night before you go to bed, you can sit there and say, I am going to astral project, or I'm going to leave my body, use whatever words you're comfortable with, or I want to experience, I want to see my body from a different perspective, from being outside my body. You can tailor this to your own inquiry. And this is easily done. I did this when I was 16. Okay, so this is easily done, and you look, you're stepping outside your body, and when I did it with, when I was 16, I was, I recoiled in fear. No big deal. I considered that a success. And then, but then you investigate, why did I recoil in fear? Now, all this stuff is, is something like, I'm retired now, so I can do all this stuff. But when you're working, it's hard when you're making a living. It's hard to do these things or make the time to do it. So you have to really, you need the mind, which you're trying to still, to investigate it, it to stop it. So the mind, you have to have, your, your mind has to be your friend. And there's going to be times where your brain just will not shut up. And you just got to just let it run and then come back to it later. When you, you were talking about the gentle shaking, um, and I've experienced that myself in like the beginning of an out-of-body experience, although I didn't feel the traumas were leaving me, um, what did that feel like with the trauma leaving? Did, did you feel like a big release with each shake? Or tell me more about that. Did you feel like something in your body? The shaking... The shaking is you're disconnecting from the body. When you die, you completely sever the connection. But when you're shaking out in the astral projection, you're just shaking out of the body. And it's very gentle. It's very soothing. And it's just a beautiful thing. Now, if you're experiencing trauma, that's a whole new deal. And so what you need to do is if you, if you come out and you get frightened or something or you're scared, you recoil. Okay. You realize now you have to deal with trauma. So I used, and I got rid of my, I helped, I worked for, you know, seven days a week for 26 years. So I didn't have time for any mystical endeavors. But after I retired, I sure did. And it's kind of like a cycle of life. You know, you go through life and you work really hard. And then at the retirement, you figure, oh, well, that's the golden years. Eh, nothing golden about them, but it's good investigative years, right? So what you do is, I use the Wim Hof technique but I modified it to my behavior, okay? Which means I made it more gentle, but persistent. And it was constant breathing back and forth. And if you think about it, it's like a wave. And the first trauma I released was located on my vagus nerve because I could feel it. And it was the hardest thing ever. It was so hard to deal with it because I had to relive it. It was unpleasant. And I saw that and I kept breathing into it, breathing into it. I wouldn't stop. I just kept breathing into it. And it released. And it, it uncovered this, it's something quite amazing. I had a lot of trauma. I mean, a significant amount. And I had to release. It took me a year and a half to solve it all. And I was working at it every day. And there would be some days that would be very productive. And there's some days that would be non-productive. But when it was productive, I noticed I was almost in a trance-like breathing. And I knew that at that point, I was on to something. And I, each trauma I released, released, it covered up my being. It put dirt on my being. Now the dirt or dust was moved away. And I became more whole. I became more present. And then when the trauma finally left, now when you do the first one, I don't know how anyone else is going to react. When I released the first trauma, that was it for me. I'm going for them all. And this isn't stopping until I get done because I want to see what's, what's been covered. And why? Because in my physical body, I've always felt this, even since I was a kid, that my I'm having a diminished experience in life. It's not a full experience. I want to have a full experience. And 
if I die in the process, well, I know what that's all about. So that's no big deal to me. So this was able to give you a full experience by releasing your trauma. When you release your trauma, you'll realize your trauma restricted you. Your trauma molded your ego or your mind. And it, it covered up something. It covered up. What did it cover up? It covered up your presence. It's covered up your being. So you can you can't have full expression. Now I'm sure this is one woman I I used to watch. She was the animal communicator. Her name was Anna Breitenbach, and she was a meditator. She went to India also, and she learned to communicate with animals. She had to transcend her behavior to do that. See, we don't know our full potential. Our full potential isn't to come into this physical body and go out and get involved in a real estate market and making a living. That's not what we came here to do. We came here to have this full experience, but our experience is diminished. What diminishes it? Well, basically fear and desire. So how did your life change as a result of releasing this trauma? Oh, everything changed. It's like I had a, a whole new chapter now and I became an investigator. People talk about uh, remote viewing. Boom, oh, that's easy to do. We can do that. All of us can do it. What restricts you from doing it? Fear and desire, trauma. That opened up. My meditations became much deeper. I, I have done so many experiments. I have the... Um, I I was I, I worked in real estate and sometimes I would go into a house and I could feel someone in there. And one particular example, I called the listing agent and I said, listen, did the husband die? And she goes, how do you know that? And I said, well, because he's still here. So you can you have this extra sensory perception that is covered by fear and diminished. That opens up. You can feel when something bad is going to happen or something good is going to happen. You feel it before it happens. And that's our real being. That's what our real being does. It's not restricted. The only thing that restricts us is our mind, which has been indoctrinated into our social structure and our family structure. That's what limits it. I found it interesting that uh, you said you were excited about death when you were going through this three days of dying. Um, you you came across a tremendous fear that you welcomed. Exactly. And that, that is, that's just so fascinating for me. Can you go in a little bit deeper into that and talk about like what it can feel like to welcome fear and what was that doing to benefit the process of dying for you? Okay, so say you're in the process of dying and, 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 and your fear is really strong because your mind is really powerful. Well, my mind was really diminished because it didn't have a lot of energy to run, so it was weakened. So there is this fear that I'm dying. So I didn't really face much of that because it was so easy to transcend. I just looked at the fear and realized, oh, it's my mind. You see, because I was feel I was coming from a position of presence because I was diminished physically in strength. And so that was so simple to overcome. Now, when, say, for example, you're fully healthy, you're vibrant, and you're astral, you want to astral project or astral travel, okay? Your mind is really alive and your mind's going, whoa, whoa, we're not going to do that because that will challenge your ego and diminish your mind and your mind knows that. And so it's a different challenge than what I had. But when I, when I felt the fear, I said, okay, see, I want to go, I want to see what everything is now. I was bold and brave. And I wanted to see what everything is. In fact, that's probably my personality flaw. I want to see what everything is. And I, if, I, if there's something that someone says, you can do this, I want to see if that's possible. And sometimes people say things and they're just repeating what someone else has said. They're not saying it from a position of experience. When you say it from a position of experience, you should be able to tell the folks the way and how they can experience, which is my objective. And I don't, I'm not going to write a book. <laughs> I have no motivation here. I don't do anything for money, nothing. I keep money out of this completely so that people can say, well, you're just trying to make money. No, I'm not. I'm not interested in it. 
your genuine interest is to help others experience their eternal spiritual self as well. Is that correct? Well, ask yourself this question. Don't you want to experience it? Absolutely. There's your answer. Do you know the way? Who's going to show you? So you're searching. You started this channel because you're searching. And okay, that's the only reason I did the interview because I was done doing interviews because I had a feeling that you were searching. And I said, okay, let's see where she wants to go. And so that's what I do. And I've helped a lot of people die. I've talked to people in hospice. My sister went through 14 months of chemotherapy before she died. And I can tell you without a doubt, because my nephew was there, she died with a smile on her face and no fear. One of my good friends, the first person I told this story to, he was a doctor. He died. In the yard, his wife called us up and said he had a smile on his face when he died. No fear. And that was because you spent some time with them, yeah. helping them to cross over or, or to lose their fear of crossing over. I told them what to expect. And every, everything I told you, I'm telling you what to expect. And as you're passing, even if you decide just to ask or project, you will sit there and you say, oh, that's what he said. And it, you, it, it's no different. It's all the same way. We all leave the body the same way. Some of us do it slower. Some of us do it rapidly. But it's all the same way. You disconnect from the body. So each time something happens like the shaking, you're strengthened now because you knew it was coming. It's not a surprise. Because the reason is your mind is still attached. When the mind dies, then there is no fear. And then everything will be natural. But the mind is going to be alive. In fact, the mind can be alive for minutes after your heart stops. When Steve Jobs died, what was, what did he go? He goes, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. When Danny and Olivia Harrison watched George Harrison die, they saw something leave his body. There's tons of stories out there like this. So we all know it's coming. We all know. But my thing is, go try it now. Really explore this. Drink from that fountain. And you will go back again and again. And then when you die, you embrace a greater reality more rapidly. And it's fuller. The experience I had, I cannot even explain to you. I, I, I can't I don't even know how. But it was so much, so much. But it's not overwhelming. Tell me how you came to know the Wim Hof breathing method and that that would get you to that place. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. I just tried it. I, I said, okay, I have trauma. How do I get rid of this trauma? Well, there's something called rebirthing. I and mean, I wasn't really, I, I watched a video on that. That wasn't for me, right? Then I watched a video on Wim Hof and I go, yeah, that's for me. I just, you know, you want, you just try things. You, it's like, how do you know if the food's any good unless you try it? How do you know if this going up the side of a mountain is going to be any good unless you try it? You have to always try everything. Now, if you're unable to try it because you don't have the ability to move or stuff, oh, that's even better because now you can go internally straight away. And there's nothing to stop you because I want to see what's in there. Because that's, remember, that's the objective is, or the ultimate experience is you are going to come, you're going to take the body and you're going to remove all that dust of life and society. And then you're going to realize this which is located here, this power center is another way of looking at it, but it's consciousness or it's presence or it's being. It's located right here and it's diminished only because of what's here. But you still, these are all energy centers we have in our bodies. We have all these energy centers and you have to deal with that. You have to have a little knowledge. You can gain that on YouTube. Videos like this. And you have to explore, I mean, Magellan, sailed the seven seas, Columbus sailed the seven seas. You just got to find the explorer in you. Can you give me an example or show me how you breathe using the Wim Hof method? And then maybe talk about how people can find out the best way for them to do it. Well, there's two more breathing, and that's typically your, your breathing that is associated with Tibet and Buddhists. And there's yogic breathing, and there's yoga centers everywhere. And you want to breathe, and it's just you could just even Google um, how can I breathe through or use AI. How can I breathe? What are the what is the breathing techniques to release uh, tension and trauma? Okay, 
So how I breathe is very simple. Say some people say you breathe through your nose, exhale through your mouth. Oh, that's like way too complicated for me, right? I'm not doing that, right? I just do nasal in breath, out breath, and it's basically I start out. Now I'm breathing down into my below my belly button, and I'm creating a wave like the wave at the sea, and it gets a rhythm. At first, it's awkward, just like everything. Learn how to dance. It's, it's awkward as it can be at first, right? So you breathe and you get a rhythm and then you practice it and you go, oh, this is really boring. Well, one day, Samantha, as my wife is in here and she looked at the watch, she looked at the time and I was in breathing for three hours. I didn't even realize I was in there for three hours and I'm just doing. And then that breathing sometimes will change where you go. Then you go back to it and you go back to it. And what it's doing is it's kind of loosening up the tension in your body. It's relaxing your body so that you can relax the traumatized nerve. Because a traumatized nerve is not a relaxed nerve. If you see someone that's hypervigilant, they typically have PTSD, they're traumatized. 80, it's estimated that 80% of the American population has, uh, has PTSD, traumatic, traumatic stress disorder. We live in a stressful world right now. Well, you have to make a living. This is yeah. the thing you do. And it, it's the world is right now. It is in the process of changing. So it's going to become, it is stressful. And it's going to become more stressful. And we're going through some crazy stuff right now. But, you know, it's changing. And is it easy? Change is never easy. But to do the breathing technique, you can relax your body. Even if you don't have an astral projection or start remote viewing, even if you just relax your body, isn't that a bonus? And the breathing will do that. It will do that just on its own. So you get a bonus right away. I love that. I'm going to start doing this today. I'm going to try it. Oh, never stop. Never and stop. Have a way of contacting me. If you run into a snag, just contact me and I'll tell you what the snag is. And do you just lay flat on your bed or? Oh, no. Here's sit? the beautiful part. <laughs> oh, this is the beautiful part. You're like a yogi. They're sitting like this in the yoga position. Oh, all that stuff. Like that. I don't have to do any of that. I have a massage chair. Sometimes I do it there. Sometimes I do it in the bed, laying on my back on my side. Sometimes I do it on the couch with my feet up on top of the couch. You don't have to be in any position at all. You can, all you have to do is the breathing. And then once you train your body to breathe, you're going to notice another fact that you're breathing properly in all your daily activities and you're not breathing shallow. You are oxygenating your body. So even though it feels like shallow breathing, it's deeply oxygenating your body. This is not shallow breathing. You are inflating. You're not inflating your lungs. They fill up, however. You are inflating your gut. And your gut's moving, right? Or your belly, whatever you want to call it. And it's moving. And it's pre it makes like this wave. Like you go down to the Puget Sound or wherever your ocean you're close to. And, and you feel those waves and like you can be in a bad mood and you go to the ocean side and within 20 minutes, you're in a pretty good mood. It's the same thing. It's nature. It's natural. It's not complicated. Plus, if you have issues with um, um, sinus problems and you can't quite breathe, right, because one of your sinuses is blocked, I, you can use Afrin, but not, not more than two or three times. But you can use Flonase, you can do that stuff, or you can do just xylitol water. And that typically will open up your sinuses. So what will happen is now that you've done the breathing technique, say, for three weeks, both of your sinuses are wide open. Your mind is very aware, but there's an alertness that goes beyond your, your mind because you are so alert up here that the mind is not running amok all the time it stops and then you have those moments, those long moments of being still. When you first have a still moment, it, it goes, boom, gone, okay. After a while, it's longer and longer and longer and longer. And sometimes I'll just stand out in the kitchen and I'll just be standing there for 20 minutes. And my mind is so still that when you come out of that, it's like, life is a pretty good deal. It's okay. And you, you take a look at your, you go, yeah, I had a rough life, but it's okay today, right? I like that. Yeah. It's like Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now, you know. Oh, I like him. He's yeah. a, I met him in spirit. He's a real deal. 
I like him too. I love his power of now. How yeah. right now? What's wrong right now? Right. Nothing. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's pretty amazing um, because our 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 being our our experience in this physical life is diminished. But remember, remember this: you took this body as a challenge. People say, "Well, you chose your destiny." Well, your destiny is just you took it as a challenge. That's about as far as it goes. And you took it as a challenge. Okay, meet the challenge. Well, I know we weren't sure if we were going to actually talk about what happened after you died or from the moment that you died on, but I'm just really interested to hear about that if you don't mind telling me. Okay, so we'll go back to the story I was telling. And I was standing outside of my form, my body, because it was dead. And you don't know how pleasant that was. That I had to let go of this. You ever, you hear like you watch a TV show and they say, uh, I can't remember the name of the show. I think it was Men in Black, where they say he's he's in a meat suit or something. Mm -hmm. it, honest to God, it's a meat suit, <laughs> and it, it is totally true. And you understand that. And then I was just standing there, being aware. I could see through the walls and stuff like that. And, and I'm glad you brought this up because it's, it's something I want to say to you personally. Is um, so, I shifted and moved maybe just to, just a few inches the first time. And then I moved about a yard or a meter. And I, everything that the hotel room was gone, my body, my the beds were gone, my body was gone, everything was gone. Everything was gone. I was in a completely different place. It was a place where everything was golden. And I was met by other beings that knew me. And I knew them. And they said, one being comes up to me. And, and, but I got to tell you, let me step back a little bit because I'm getting ahead of myself. So when you first come out of your body and, and you, you look, I'm looking at the sick body. Now, my feet aren't on the ground. I'm hovering, right? So there is no place to plant your spiritual feet. And But it's all through thought where you are. It's felt like so much more like that. There's so much more. Now, when you shift to this land of golden, light there is so 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 much more it is like so much right but none of it is overwhelming so then this being comes up to me and we, he says and you present it as a male he says we need you to go back to your body in the hotel room and i said no i'm not going back not a chance and then then there was some moments there now remember when you're dead there's no time there's it just doesn't there's no time but now let me walk you back just one other time after i got on my body and did that first shift completely away from my body i saw all these lives i had lived prior and i'm not prior is an incorrect word and i could see them in like little bubble formats and i would look at one and i would look at it like oh i just lived that life from birth to death all your lives you have including this one are happening simultaneously there is no linear time. None of that stuff is real. I could have been out of my, and I, in this life, I have experienced uh, time dilation. I fell, which normally takes less than a second, but I was able to completely turn over and land on all four, my, four, my feet and my hands. I was able to land on all fours like a cat. And that's not possible because I fell on the ice. And that's not possible. No one can do that. I've done that several times. Okay, so now that's a side. I took you off a little side trail. Okay, so let's get back to this side. They told me I, I, they wanted me to go back to my body. And I declined. So then I meet this guy. They say that I meet this guy. And all of a sudden, there was a cafe appeared. And all this stuff was just, because everything's radiant and gold. But they made a setting for me, right? And then the setting was I met this guy at a cafe. And he introduced himself. He said in one of his lives, he was George Gurdjieff. Okay, no, I didn't know who George Gurdjieff was until I got back. And then and there's another story with that. And then he says, we need you to go back to your body. And I said, okay. But then I heard a thought from one of the beings that first met me. He said, you will lose all memory of this encounter. And I said, I'll go back on the condition I don't lose memory. All this memory stays intact. I negotiate stuff. 
And so they sent me back, but I didn't go back myself. I couldn't. I went back with several other beings. They had to reattach me to the body. And that was this, that was actually unpleasant. This body is cold. It's wet and it's very heavy. And I can remember the, how uncomfortable that was for weeks after I returned to my body. I had to reanimate it and it was unpleasant. And if you read my story, you'll see an Indian doctor walked in and they rebuilt my blood sugar and stuff like that. But uh, that's pretty much my death story and back. And then I wasn't that I never told anyone about the story, except for if I met someone that was dying, I would tell them how to die. I would do that. And that was really successful because this is going to sound a little bit odd. But like the first guy, I told the story to he was a doctor. He had a he knew he was dying and he said, Don't keep tell me how to die. Well, two weeks after his death. I hear someone calling my name and Samantha and I are sleeping, right? So I sit up and there's this, my doctor friend standing in the doorway of our master bedroom. And he's all bathed in golden light and smiling, okay? Pretty interesting evening. So I knew he made it. And from that, many people have come to me after they've died and let me know they, that they, it worked. And it was natural. And I, and I, and I go, okay. Okay, I know it works because I died. I mean, I don't doubt any of this, right? There's no doubt in my being at all that this is how it plays. And I won't be here much longer. I'm going to be 70 years old this year. I don't have a lot of time left. So I'm looking forward to exiting this life. Because I know this is my last life. Oh, and when I met Gurdjieff and he sent me back, he told me a whole bunch of stuff. I don't want to get into do too much detail with that because it was some future stuff. But he said, this is your last life. You don't ever have to come back again. Why is this your last life? Is there a lesson that you needed to learn here? Oh, is there a mission okay. that you had to complete? That's a fabulous question. That is a beautiful question. Everyone sits there and goes, I'm, I, they, they sometimes refer to this life as a school. None of that's true. It's just an experience. So you can experience what is the opposite of who you truly are. So when you are like in full being, you don't have to feed your body. You don't have to clothe your body. You don't have to have a house to live in. You don't have to suffer. So here we experience all this suffering and stuff. It's just an experience. Let's call it um, spiritual AI. That's all it is. It's not, there's not like, oh, I have to learn this to be a better person. No, 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 no. No, you already are the better person. This being is complete. It's all complete. That's what I like to say is that it's like a ride, like you would go on a roller coaster because it's exciting and you get the adrenaline rush. Um, but it's it's not because you have to learn, you know, how to sit in a roller coaster you know you do it for the experience for the fun um and that's kind of how i i think of it no i've actually used that same analogy it's like you want to go on that roller coaster one more time and so but okay and in the, in the, so here's the thing it's perfectly okay to take another body perfectly okay it's perfectly okay to have whatever experience you want. And also, remember when I told you I was looking at all the lives I had lived? You don't necessarily, it's not linear. You're not going to go to a future event. You can go to a past event if you want. And when I looked at that one life, it looked like they were like little eggs, like an eggshell. When I looked at life, I lived that life from beginning to end like that. And when I looked at this life, it went that fast. It was just boom. That's how fast it goes from the position of being. Take me back all the way to the beginning because I feel like near-death experiences are so unique to each individual. They're almost like custom experiences for who an individual is. There aren't any two that are really very closely related. There's similarities, um, similar things happen. But I feel like they're they're still very unique, um, and as was yours. Um, 
tell me about who you were before these experiences you were in in India on a spiritual journey. Uh, do you feel like your life before your experience colored it? Well, I grew up in a very traumatized household, as many Americans have and Europeans and other people, right? And I had certain events happen throughout my life that made me question everything didn't believe anything the Catholic Church said. And I apologize to all the Catholics out there who have faith, because I think Jesus is a fabulous being, right? And, but I didn't buy any of the thing the priest was saying. I didn't buy anything society was saying. I didn't ever really fit in this world from my perspective. At 16 years old, I grew up in New York, family moved to Minnesota. And I, at 16 years old, I, slipped out of my bedroom one night, walked into a swamp. I had a stick about that long. And I walked in, it was a harvest moon. I just turned 16 that earlier that month. And I walked into uh, the swamp and I sat there all night. No devil, no boogeyman, no vampires, no, none of this stuff existed. And I realized I had been seriously lied to. And I have been seriously programmed. I'm 16 right now. And I also, because of the traumatized life, I would, I, was, I had migraines most of my life. And so I go in there with pain. I'm under pain the whole time. And But I realized that wasn't true. So then I finished high school. Then I went out and worked a little while, went to university, didn't work for me. And I go, because I just needed to know what this life was so that I picked this book up by a uh, guy I picked up I met several Indian teachers right one was uh, Osho who had a he called himself Rajneesh I met him first I said okay I'll go there because I read his book and, and everything in that book made sense to me so I wanted to go meet this fellow and that's what changed my world now he was a very controversial guy right but you know I never stuck with the group um, I went there just to meet him and that was clearly my objective and I stayed there for several months actually quite a few months. And um, then I met other teachers and, you know, best the people were presented to me. I said, I have to go see this guy. So I thought of this guy and I was compelled to go see him, right? And there's some really good female teachers too. There's this one Buddhist woman now who I've also met in spirit, who teach, who, who's a, she teaches meditation in Australia. And so there's a lot of really quality teachers out there now. And I was just looking for answers. And as a, you know, as a young kid, I just knew that the world was wrong. And I didn't buy into any of anything that was going on. We live in a very strange world. I find it interesting that you were on a journey to find yourself <laughs> when you had this experience, like the ultimate finding yourself experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Well, on the on the way to India, the first time I went a few times, um, the airplane hit wind shears. We had a layover in Tokyo. It hit wind shears, and people were screaming and crying and vomiting on the airplane. I was completely calm. Not only calm, but you know, I was laughing because everyone was so terrified. And my point was, if we die, what's the point of being scared? What's the point? Just you just go, just accept it. Because that's what Steve Jobs did, didn't he? That's what uh, George Harrison did. They just accepted it because what's your option? I resonate with this so much. I love every word. Um, so thank you really for, I know that you're kind of not doing these interviews anymore. So thank you very much for. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't going to do it, but then I had that. All right. Let's see. I, I knew you are looking for something. I hope that I was able to encourage you to just keep looking until you find what you're looking for. I feel like this conversation is very divinely guided. And a lot of my conversations are with my guests. Um, but I don't feel like any of these conversations happen by accident. And whatever, I think there's a message that's meant to get out through, through, through my channel for whatever reason. My channel was a calling. I had a calling to do it. So... I feel like it's a very important work. Um, and so that's why it means so much, just not to me just personally, but to, 
talk to my viewers about this as well, because to give them like the step-by-step -step instructions on how to have an awesome experience on their own. Oh my gosh. That's, do you know, that's priceless. Well, and here's the beautiful part about it. it, it you should never have to have to pay for it, ever. Yeah. It's something that, you know, that I, so I, I actually refuse to take money. I absolutely said not a chance because then it brings in motive for me, right? And I've spoken to cardiologists. I've spoken to uh, people in hospice. I've spoken to dear friends that I just wanted them to know you're in for a really wonderful experience. And it is just exceptional. I can't, if I could like do the Vulcan mind melt, yes, I like science fiction, right? If I could do that with you, you would sit there and you'd go, I'm ready now. And you would, because it was that beautiful. It is without compare until it comes to the point where you realize you've done it before. But in that, in that transitionary process of leaving the body and stuff, there is nothing like it. It is like with, it is just with out exception and I know I keep repeating myself with that but it is it's the most wonderful thing ever and there's people the one other thing I will tell you is as you pursue this you be very quiet about it you don't tell this to anybody because it will people I wrote my story and some people around me got really jealous and I wrote my story because Osho showed up in my hallway I was meditating and this was in 2015 he shows up in my hallway and i look at him and i'm going and and, and i i just go i'm gonna have to do something and i didn't know what it was turns out i wrote the story i published it in osho news two other people were having seminars on uh, death and dying because every all the old people people are getting older and they're dying so the story was put in there and i had i got a lot of traction on it a lot of people got very jealous from my story which is fine they can my skin is pretty thick right and you can you can say anything you want about me i don't care because i know <laughs> that's not shakeable do you think negative energy can also influence your results others negative energy they will try to yeah but once you're established in being and once you realize your mind and you stop it you can sit there and have all of a sudden this thought can come in. It could be oh yeah, 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 pounding on you, right? But then you go, wait a minute, I can stop it. You still your mind, and you realize that energy came from an external source. And I was a real estate appraiser for thirty years, twenty six years with a big lender, and I met. I would walk into a house, and there'd be something in that house, right? And I met a lot of people who were into witchcraft and black magic, right? You start to recognize, I did over 20,000 appraisals. So you start to recognize this. And they're dark, but okay, you're dark, not my problem. Not my problem. Just don't let them in your house. And don't tell anyone what you're doing. Until you get to the point where it's so solid in you that you cannot be shaken. You will live a better life if you um, transcend your trauma if you can move outside of your body at choice and even if it if you just do it once in a while because you need like i found a friend that really helped me man she was just like the most wonderful being she passed in in december 2022 but i found her in in uh in thailand and she goes oh you found me because she came here and i and i tracked her down and found her and so she helped me a lot with the breathing she was the one who really inspired that in me. And, uh, but I met her only in spirit, not in physical form. Do you have any last words of wisdom for my viewers? Yeah, just enjoy, enjoy your life. And really, once you understand this is a journey, make it a fabulous journey. Don't be restricted by fear. Don't be restricted by trauma. Don't adopt social norms as the truth look everywhere try everything you possibly can try with the exception of drugs i don't go for drugs okay especially alcohol is the worst drug you can ever do and but just try it with a meditative approach and this is a wonderful journey but as i can tell you right now since i'm old 
it goes that fast. Just the other day, I was 25. I swear to you. That was decades ago. <laughs> Doug, this has been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for joining me and for sharing your experience and the wisdom that you've gained throughout the years and the step-by-step -step instructions on how to have our own experience. So that just means so much to me. Great. And I'm glad that, that it meant something to you. I also enjoy this. And you're so young going on this journey. You remind me of me. Thank you for being here. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you being here and supporting my channel. If you haven't already subscribed, please consider subscribing if you enjoy near-death experiences and other spiritually transformative stories. It helps the algorithm know that this information is useful and push it out to more people. And that's the goal to get as many people to know that we are eternal spiritual beings and that we never die. Our bodies might die, but our essence will never die. And I want people to live with less fear. Let's all spread the word, like, comment, subscribe, share, hit that little notification bell so you get all the notifications when my videos post. Thank you for all of your support. I'm sending love to you.